morning, Pastor Aaron. Good morning, church. Please be seated. <coughs> I'm with you, Aaron. I don't like having to wear glasses either. As soon as you put them on, the crowd disappears. And let's pray as we come to God's Word. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the wonderful blessings that you have poured out upon each and every one of us. And Father, I pray, Lord God, Lord, as we come to your word right now, Father, that our hearts would be open, our hearts would be ready to receive what your spirit would speak into our life. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Over the past several weeks, Pastor Aaron's been preaching a great series on Win the Day. We've learned about flipping the script and the importance of having day tight compartments. And this is something I really took on board with what Pastor Aaron was saying. Uh, the Bible says that we've got enough troubles for today, let alone thinking about tomorrow. It's good to have day tight compartments. We've heard about kissing the wave last week, eating the frog. I'm not real big, Steve, on eating frogs. Eating the frogs, getting the hardest thing out of the way first. And four things that Pastor Aaron has to help him win the day, being prayer, being filled afresh with the Holy Spirit, reading God's Word every day and finding an expression of the Word for that day. Which brings us to this week's message on fly the kite. And the big picture is this. How you do anything is how you will do everything. On November the 9th, 1847, a civil engineer by the name of Charles Elliott Jr. was commissioned to go and build a bridge across the Niagara Gorge, joining the United States and Canada. The question that he had, though, the question that he faced was when, where, and how were they going to get that first cable across a gorge that was 250 metres wide and 70 metre cliffs on either side? How are they going to get that first cable across? Enter a guy by the name of Theodore Graves Hullett. Theodore Hullett was a, an iron worker and he came up with the rather unusual idea of going and having a kite flying contest. That's when you should have had your kite here, Steve, this morning. A kite flying contest to, to try and get a cable across the gorge and it was, the competition was won, a $10 prize, which would have been a fortune back in 1847, was won by a 15 year old boy by the name of Homan Walsh. He was able to fly the first kite right across the gorge. And the day after he flew that kite, a stronger cable was attached to that piece of string. Wow. And from that cable, they then attached uh, uh, 36 strands of 10 gauge wire that then went across the gorge. And that then went on to become what was uh, the first suspension bridge in the world that would carry a 170 tonne train. And yet it all started with this young boy flying a kite and using just a piece of string. And it resulted in the building of the world's first suspension bridge to carry a huge train. You know, the feeding of the 5,000 started with just a few fish, a few loaves, and fed thousands of people with leftovers. How incredible. The Bible says, do not despise the day of small beginnings. Excellent. You know, if you do the little things like they're big things, God can do the big things like they're little things. So let's this morning have a look again at Zechariah 4.6. As we unpack habit number four of flying the kite. Now if we think about it, you know, we... We probably all know somebody who would say that they would give more when they've got more to give. You know, if you're not someone who's 
generous with a little time, a little talent, a little treasure, then you're probably not going to be generous when you've got a lot. Sometimes people will say, hey, I'll serve more when I've got more time. You know, you don't make time. You find the time. If we want to see big things happen, you know, we've got to go and seize those small opportunities that come across our path each and every day. And I wonder how many small opportunities we do let slip by. Small opportunities to do that random act of kindness that we talk about. I remember some 18 months ago, I was at a service station at Woolies and I just went to go and pay for my fuel and the lady behind the counter said to me, Sir, the person who was just standing in front of you has paid your fuel. Okay. Wow. We were both like, okay, a random act of kindness. Okay. But that stuck in my memory. Yep. 18 months later, a random act of kindness. What are the small opportunities that you can seize? The big idea this morning is how you do anything is how you will do everything. Very Church, good. if we're faithful with just a little, yeah. <laughs> then very likely we're going to be faithful with a lot. Yeah. So go ahead. Have a big dream. Show me the size of your dream and I can show you the size of the God that you serve. Excellent. Have a dream that is so big that without... God's divine intervention, it's sure to fail. Because otherwise, if the dream is that small that you can achieve it yourself, where's God for him? But don't just dream big. Start small and go long. Now that kite string was just a small thing, but it went long and eventually went on to connect two countries. Setting the scene for Zechariah 4.6. Zerubbabel, who was the leader of the people, led the remnant back to Judah. And he had a God-sized vision. He wanted to go and rebuild the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed back in 586 BC. Half a century later, God says to Zerubbabel, as Zerubbabel's surveying all the ruins, imagine looking at the ruins of the temple, seeing nothing but trash all around, and then God says, it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Excellent. Zerubbabel, it's not going to be by how strong you are, it's not going to be by how smart you are, or the best team that you have with you, it's going to be by the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, for me, I'm below average. And I'm sure that there's other people here who could say exactly the same thing. But, you know, thank God that God doesn't call the qualified. God qualifies those whom he calls. Excellent. Now, church, with the help of the Holy Spirit, you can do anything. Philippians 4.13. Now, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As we rely on the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit comes in and he brings that X factor. Yeah. The Holy Spirit comes on the scene and the Holy Spirit is the difference between the best that we can do and the best that God can do. Excellent. And you know what? God wants to do things in you. God wants to do things through you. God wants to do things for you yep. that are way beyond your ability and way beyond your resources and way beyond your wildest imagination. Why does he do that? So he can be glorified. How does he do it? By his spirit. Zechariah 4, 6 and 7, So he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. 
Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. What are you, mighty mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Boy, you wouldn't want to say that name too many times, would you? <laughs> my goodness. I have absolutely no idea what mountain you might be facing. Now, it might be a mountain of anxiety, addiction, fear. Whatever mountain you might be facing, they're the times that we can fall back on those things that we know for sure. We know for certain and beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is still the God who makes his way through the Red Sea. He's still the God who makes the sun stand still. He is still the God who turns water into wine. He is still the God who moves mountains in your life. And he is still the God today who can call life out of death. Yeah. And if you're taking notes, write this down. That testimony is prophecy. That's right. And what do I mean by that? It's pretty simple. If God has done it before, God can do it again. If he's rolled the stone away before, he can do it again. And I know that because the Bible says that God's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever, into the future. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain, will stand in Zerubbabel's way. Nothing was going to stand in his way of rebuilding the temple. It was going to become a level plain. Yeah. Church, we've got several habits just in this small passage of Scripture. Habit number one, we flip the script by speaking to the mountain. You go on the offence yeah. by exercising your authority. You, you declare the will of God. You declare the glory of God. The second habit was kiss the wave. Now, sometimes we see the obstacle as being the enemy. But the obstacle is not the enemy. The obstacle is the way through. You know, you don't go around a mountain by faith. God gets you to the other side. And when God does that, we're actually bigger and better people for that. We have authority to speak to the mountains that are in our life. Who has the authority? We do. We, do. Yeah. we have the authority to speak to the mountain. How do we do it? We do it with faith as small as a mustard seed. And how is something so small become something so powerful? Well, that's where habit number three, eating the frog, comes in. You know, it's those, those high leverage habits that yield big results over time. I loved what um, Pastor Aaron said last week. The domino effect. You know, just little by little. Uh, um, a six inch domino can knock over a ten inch domino. A ten inch domino can knock over one that's fifteen inches. And so on and so forth until you get something so big it could knock over the Eiffel Tower. High leverage hab habits have a domino effect. Church, if you want God to go and do the super in your life, then you've got to be the one who does the natural. Excellent. And this is where we fly the kite, the kite of faith. Love this verse. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. Now, come on, God, bring on the big stuff. I'm ready. Now I'm wanting to do the big stuff. Church, if we can't handle the little stuff, very unlikely God's going to come and bring in the big stuff. Now, a plumb line, a kite string, it's all the same thing. Here's the rubber balls. A plumb line, by the way, was uh, an ancient measuring tape. Now, he's standing there. He's just got his tape measure out. He's just looking around, he pulls out a tape measure, and God starts rejoicing. So good. How amazing is that? You know, sometimes we think, you know, we've got to have this huge project. Yeah. When the project's completed, we'll rejoice. Zerubbabel hasn't even technically started. 
He's just holding a tape measure and God's, God's rejoicing. Hasn't got any plans, hasn't got his blueprints, hasn't got council approval. He's got a tape measure. God rejoices. God isn't just great because nothing is too big for God. Yes, God moves the mountains. But our God is great because nothing is too small for him. He celebrates the small steps. He celebrates the small acts of kindness that we do to someone. You know, we want to go and do big, amazing and great things for God. You know, that's not our job. God is the one who does amazing things for us. Our job is to consecrate ourselves. Our job is to set ourselves apart for God one day at a time. Yeah. And you get up the next morning and you set yourself apart for God again and for service. And if we do our job, God does His. If we are the ones who go and fly the kite, God comes on the scene and builds the bridge. You know, that young boy who won the contest, he wasn't given the task of building the bridge. His job simply, go fly the kite. Yes, Get it to the other side. Go high, go long. There are times, I think, though, that we can just be so overwhelmed by the size and the scope of, of the goals and dreams that we have. And that's probably why... They say something like 75% of New Year's resolutions fail within the first month. Did you know that 83% of people would one day, one day, like to go and write a book? Very few do. Why is that? Because you can't finish what you don't start. It doesn't matter whether you're writing a book, running a marathon, thon, wanting to do a degree. You can't finish what you don't start. You have to go and reverse engineer the goals and turn them into daily habits. And as you do that, that's when you start to fly the kite. Yeah. That's the introduction. Three simple keys for this morning. Firstly, give yourself a start date. It's been said a dream without a deadline is dead on arrival. Now, you might be dreaming of this, that, the other thing for years, but you cannot finish where you don't start. My dad, uh, when I was growing up, he always loved boats. And so he would, he would build a number of boats over several years, but he started small with a rowboat, dinghy. And then he got bigger and bigger until he got to the point where he wanted to build a 33-foot cabin cruiser. We lived 100 kilometres from the water, and you can think of the logistics for that for a start. But you know what? He couldn't finish unless he started. He had all the plans, and he had the dreams, and he'd look at them and everything, but it came to the point when he had to have a start date so that he could finish. You can't finish where you don't start. You know, the other problem is that we can all come up with any number of excuses, can't we? <coughs> any number of excuses of why we don't do something. Some of the common ones. I'm not qualified. Who is? I'm not smart enough. You know, I don't have enough experience. Thank God that he doesn't call the qualified, but he qualifies the call yeah. on the job training. Mm. There you go. God wants to use the strong hand, but he also uses the weak. You know, the, the day that King David, before he was King David, was anointed by the prophet to be king, the prophet had gone and looked at all his other brothers. They're good looking, they're strong, they're intelligent, rah, rah, rah. David wasn't even in the building. And the prophet says, hey, there's got to be somebody else, because the one I'm looking for ain't here. God uses the weak as well. The Bible says that God's power is made perfect in weakness. Right. 
I'm not qualified. I'm not ready. If you wait until you're ready, you're going to be waiting a long time. Who's, you know, we, we drive around town here, we pull up at the traffic lights, and it's red. Then it goes amber, green. Who's ever sat at the traffic light when it's been green and you've still sat there? Yeah, yeah I know, I have too. <laughs> but you know what? The green light means go. go. If God has given you a green light for something, then it's go. <coughs> when God called me into Bible college some 25 years ago, I certainly was not ready. I'd done grade 12. I hadn't done any tertiary studies at all at that point. I didn't even know why God was calling me into Bible college. That was the last place I wanted to go. But I felt very, very strongly in my spirit that God was saying, Hey, Mark, I need you to go to Bible college. Okay. I didn't know why. I didn't know that that was the first step that God was showing me to become a pastor, which I didn't want in the first place anyway. And so we're in, Linda and I were in church. We are only going out, I think, at that time. And I was listening to the message. You know, I was thinking, God, I don't want to do this. That Sunday morning, I can't remember his name, but I remember his message. The guy from South Africa came. And he was preaching on that wonderful passage of scripture when God called Moses. And Moses didn't like the idea. And, God, and Moses came up with any number of excuses. God, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I can't speak well enough. And on, on, that was on the Sunday morning, on the Sunday night. I couldn't tell you what the message was about because all I was doing was arguing with God the whole time about why I didn't want to go to college. Because they made an announcement, Aaron, in church about going to Bible college. Straight away, I thought, God say, hey, you need to go to college. So I argued with God. Linda, excuse me, Linda was concerned because I wasn't even speaking to her. And we went out for dinner after church that night, and I still wasn't speaking to her. And then she, what's wrong? I really feel God's wanting me to go to college. And I argued with God so hard. I'm not smart enough. I'm not a good speaker. I can't do this. I can't do that. Then I remembered the, the line from the message in this morning, in the morning, that Moses had argued, come up with the excuses, and God got angry with him. And I thought to myself that night, I thought, you know, getting God angry with you is not a good thing. <laughs> the rest is history. I'm not qualified. I'm not ready. Oh, here's a good one. I'm waiting for the, the perfect moment. I'm waiting for the right situation. Now, if you're waiting for the right situation, then it's never going to happen. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. If all we're doing is just standing around, watching and waiting, I wish I may, I wish I might, then nothing is ever going to happen. What do we do? We fly the kite. How do we fly the kite? We give ourselves a start date. Secondly, we dream big, but we start small. And can I add, we go long. And you do that by reverse engineering life's goals and making them into daily habits. The kite was just a small start. But it was something that went the distance. Say when. 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 We're going to do that again. Yeah. Say when. When. Win the day. Win the day. Amen. Dream big. Start small. All comes, it all comes back to this. You need to have an uncompromising commitment to continual improvement. You know, it's that, that little by little. Right. But it pays compound interest at the end. Dream big. But start small. You know, you've got to find a way, bless you, bless you. You've got to find a way to fly the kite a little bit further 
and a little bit higher every day. And as we do that, that's when we start to see mountains becoming level plains. We have to start small, but we think long. You know, it's, it is so easy to get really discouraged when you've got a God-sized goal. <coughs> Which is why, like I said before, 75% of New Year's resolutions fail within the first month. Sometimes it can seem that our goal is just getting further and further and further away. It's almost like it becomes unattainable. It's moments like that that we need to remember the future. Now you can't lose faith in the end of the story and you need to remind yourself of what you're doing and why you're doing it. There's a story about three bricklayers back in 1666, London was devastated by this huge fire. And a gentleman by the name of Christopher Wren was given the task of going and rebuilding St Paul's Cathedral. And one day, I love this story, one day in 1671, Christopher Wren was going out to the building site and he saw three bricklayers standing there working on the same section, working on the same scaffold. And he says to one of them, says to the first bricklayer, mate, what are you doing? And he's like, well, duh, I'm laying bricks, you can see that. The second guy said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm building a wall. The third person. The third person said, I'm building a cathedral to the glory of God. You know, three people, same section, doing the same job, but each of them had a very, very different mindset. There you go. Now, a couple of them were thinking there and then and now. The other one was thinking long and into the future and seeing a cathedral being built to the glory of God. Give a start date. Dream big and start small. And if you want every day to count, count the days. If you want every day to count, count the days. I've been, I worked this out the other day, I've been a credential pastor with Australian Christian churches for some 23 years, six months, two weeks, five days, what's the time, Aaron? Uh, five days, yeah, give or take an hour or two. I was interviewed at 11 o'clock in the morning. I've seen the good side of the ministry and I've seen the bad side of the ministry. I've been on the mountaintop. And by hang, I've experienced the valley as well. If you want every day to count, count the days. It's been said that if you don't count the days, then you're discounting them. And that's not about having a play on words. It's about having an approach to life that lives each day like it's the first and the last day of your life. Our series started with the question, can you do it for a day? Now, anybody can do most things, you know, for a day. But then you've got to get up the next day and do it all over again. And if you do something for two days in a row, then really you're starting to get yourself onto a winning streak. And that's what flying the kite is about. It's about having consistency. It's about perseverance. It's about little by little doing those little things that can have a high impact and make a difference. Another way of saying it is if you want to break records, you know you've got to keep records. I know when I was a youth pastor here, Mitch, every week I'd be keeping a track of the numbers. Yeah, we broke a record this week. Now we had an extra 10 kids at youth. You've got to keep records to break records. You've got to measure what matters. Because if it's not measurable, it's not manageable. And part of counting the days is about celebrating your progress. Because we celebrate those things that we want to see more of. Now we celebrate milestones, we celebrate winning streaks. 
We need to take the time, church, to celebrate the miracles that God does in our life. It doesn't matter whether they're big miracles or small miracles. We like to focus so much on the big and the amazing, but there are so many small miracles that God does. You know, every single day. But sometimes we overlook and we don't celebrate. You know, Zerubbabel just had his tape measure in his hand and God's standing there, go for it, Zerubbabel. I'm rejoicing. You're about to start something great. Excellent. <laughs> Celebrate the small miracles. Celebrate the partial miracles. Finally this morning, I'll close with Zechariah saying, do not despise the day of small beginnings. Sometimes we do that, don't we? We want the big, we want the flashy, we want the bright. But we don't celebrate the small beginnings. Now we, we tend to think right here, right now. God is thinking about nations. God is thinking generationally. We think that what God has for us is just for us. God is thinking... What's in store for the third and the fourth generation beyond? And church, we overestimate what we can achieve in a year, but sometimes we tend to underestimate what God can do in, in 25 years. Now, what goal are you going after? What is that the habit that you want to break or a habit that you want to build? But if you're wanting to do that, that's when you need to fly the kite. And you do that by giving yourself a start date. Because you can't start when you don't finish. Dream big and start small. But go long as well. Go the distance. Okay. And if you want every day to count, count the days. Because it's like there are decades when it seems like nothing is happening. And yet there can be months when decades happen. Because we just don't know what God is doing behind the scenes. I heard a message from Pastor Craig Rochelle yesterday about don't stop on number six. About going around the walls of Jericho because number seven's coming. Yeah. Now we don't know what God could be about to do. Church, what kite do you need to fly? What are you waiting for? And hey, Let's go and win the day. Yeah. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Father, I thank you, Lord, for the word, fly the kind. Father, I pray that we wouldn't despise the day of small beginnings, that we would rejoice in the small things. And Father, I pray, Lord God, Lord, that you would show us this week the small things that we need to do to start building for eternity, to continue building for eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Aaron. Amen.